Joining me is the Bickner, Endowed Bickner Professor of Sport Management, Dr. Mark Rosentraub, a professor in sport management and urban planning, and he's going to help us continue this conversation about free speech in sport. So, Dr. Rosentraub, first of all, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. There's lots and lots of debate about whether or not sport is an appropriate platform for, for social and political activism. What is your take on that issue? The issue has become a little more complicated uh, because of the fact that once we get into the commercial aspect of sport, which is really where right now we're focused on, when you have a, a professional athlete who's paid by an uh, entrepreneur, team owner, and the question becomes, how does that messaging impact the commercial viability of, of the product? So if you take it from the position right now of the expressions of issues by different athletes, an owner's looking at it to saying, if, okay, we're no longer in an era where athletes are really uh, poorly compensated. We're talking about extraordinarily well compensated people. Numbers in the 20s of millions now are, are really not unusual. At what point does an entrepreneur who pays that much money to a um, employee have the right to limit their public speech? The opposite argument is that given the popularity of sport, it is an, an essentially the most powerful uh, place in which messages can be delivered in the sense that more people watch sport than watch anything else. At what point does the individual athlete have the right to extend beyond the commercial relationship that he or she has signed with an owner. And we have to be very honest, you know, you know, blunt about looking at both sides of this question. So an owner, there is a collective bargaining agreement since all the leagues have unions. The unions specify elements in the collective bargaining agreement. Every player is bound by that, by that agreement. An owner is compensating players at extraordinary levels, takes a high re level of risk. And so we're trying to balance the interests of, this, of the individual against the commercial aspects of sport because the players have benefited from the commercialization of sport. So th this becomes the tension that we're seeing play out. Some owners we've seen have gone to extensive uh, levels of supporting the players' rights. Obviously, those owners tend to be in markets where there's a lot more uh, support for the messages the players are trying to deliver. There are other investors that are in markets that are less supportive, and they feel the pressure of their commercial relationships to ask the players to sort of restrain. So that's one bucket. Mm -hmm. Then we have the second bucket, which is what happens when a player does something outside of the playing uh, field, arena, uh, ballpark? Is that commercial relationship that the player has with the owner, does it extend beyond playing on the field. And this issue has extended into everything from uh, the players network that Derek Jeter founded in the sense that he's, he's now offering players a commercial opportunity to either express their political views or get into other aspects of monetizing their value. So this free speech now gets into commercial aspects, political aspects, and then the particular markets. And the best example I would point people to is the tremendous support that ownership and management of the Golden State Warriors ha ha has had for their club. Of course, they play in the San Francisco Bay Area, which one would probably argue is among the most liberal areas of this country. And so even when the players uh, voted not to go uh, to the White House for obvious political reasons, that was supported. There wasn't one aspect. And then we've, of course, had the coach himself take on an extraordinarily uh, visible role right. in, in, that, in that activity. Mm -hmm. So this becomes a, a convoluted issue in an era in which the players have now substantially benefited from the commercial success of sport. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you talk about the tension and the ways in which athletes and owners are trying to balance, you know, protecting their own rights, their own, and, and also understanding the risks that are involved. I want to go back a little bit to talk about athletes' rights. So, you know, there are some things that athletes do that seem to be celebrated, you know, by owners. And some things could be considered activist-related. What are the type of, of free speech, free exp expressions that are acceptable in sport? And where is it crossing the line and out of bounds? 
I, I think w w where, where it gets the most tense is when uh, it takes place on the actual place where the games are being played. So w we had this furor uh, in the past uh, season over football because the protests were taking place literally on the playing field. Now, that's very separate from the reactions that might happen. For example, some of the things that LeBron James has done, but he has done those in his role as a private citizen. Now, he's using his celebrity and commercial status to advance that, but he has far less conflict because if you watch carefully, LeBron has really not focused his statements uh, to, to a large extent on the basketball court. Mm -hmm. He is using it a after. Mm -hmm. So that gets us into that this kind of um, so sort of soft area maybe a little bit gray. Mm -hmm. We're not quite sure. Uh, LeBron James clearly does not lose his, any of his rights, uh, even given his commercial relationship with Dan Gilbert and the Cleveland Cavaliers and the NBA, mm -hmm. when he is not wearing the uniform, when he is not playing, when he is not at a venue. Mm -hmm. And so he, he, he does things. We saw this situation again with Steve Kerr, you know, where when he made his presentation about his opposition to guns in schools and other settings, he was not wearing any paraphernalia of the Golden State Warriors. Mm -hmm. He identified himself basically as a resident of the state of California where the issue was being discussed. And so he, he, he felt that he was with, within his space. Mm -hmm. Now, another owner could have reacted to say, hey, whenever 24-7, you, you, know, you represent my team. We have a commercial agreement. We have a collective bargaining agreement involving the players. Mm -hmm. And th your behavior has to fit within the bounds of that collective bargaining right. agreement. One could suspect that as each of the leagues now move to uh, renegotiations, because the, the CBA's the collective bargaining agreements go on for many years. Uh, all of them will come up in the 2020s. Mm -hmm. One would suspect that this issue mm -hmm. will now be incorporated into the collective bargaining agreement, stipulating what can take place on the field of play, mm -hmm. what can take place off the field of play. Right, right. I think that's a very interesting distinction you made relative to what happens on the field and off the field and how that influences, you know, how the activism gets perceived. You do a lot of work with professional teams. You're a consultant to many of the professional sport franchises. And so athletes are saying they're speaking out about these issues because they're, they're trying to address the things that impact their communities and that right. impact their lives. Do the professional sport teams not also have a responsibility to speak out about the, the issues that are affecting the residents in the communities in the cities in which those teams are located? We have more than 130 owners. Mm -hmm. um, you get 130 people in a room. I won't say you get 132 opinions, <laughs> but, but you'll get at least. But at least, <laughs> but there is no agreement mm -hmm. uh, on this point. Which mm -hmm. I think sort of the fun part is that it's uh, fun from the sense we're observing it. It's placed the commissioners of the leagues right. in difficult positions because some of their owners want tight constraints on the players. Mm -hmm. Other owners say, no, 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 no. I'm I, I'm fine with all this. Yeah. I want my players engaged. I want my team engaged. I want my coach, manager engaged. And, and the commissioner has to try to forge, even among the owners, some kind of uh, agreement as to what is and what is not. And that's why you know, my pr projection is that in the collective bargaining agreements, uh, ownership, the commissioners, and the players are going to try to now, for the first time, spell it out because events of the last uh, 10 or 15 years have, have now crystallized this more so. Going back to where the last sort of wave of, of, of sport activism, mm -hmm. all right? So if we look at the integration of baseball, well, there again, we had a division among the owners because in effect, it was uh, not, it clearly Jackie Robinson leads it, mm -hmm. but Branch Rickey was the one who made it possible for him to forge that and then took some very uh, robust stance about players who didn't want to play with him or, and, and traded them away mm -hmm. at a time when a lot of the other owners were completely against him. And if we look at 
the rate of integration. And we always point out the fact that the Dodgers were the first, uh, but it took uh, a decade before the Boston Red Sox integrated. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the New York Yankees had an ownership stake in the black Yankees, mm -hmm. and so they were slow on the integration aspect because they had a financial best interest in maintaining mm -hmm. the Negro Leagues. Eventually, they capitulate, and by 1960, essentially, all of baseball's teams are, are integrated. Mm -hmm. And so people have to always remember, we've got 130 owners. Right. You're never going to get unanimity. Right. Well, you know, I mean, they, and you help them a lot with, I know, with the economic in impact, um, the, the research you do, the volume of books that you've written. Um, you're a prolific scholar. I don't mind saying that. I'm going to give you Thank props. You. you are. You're doing a wonderful job. But we know that the economic implications of sport, it's a big deal. But why isn't, and I, I hear you say different markets are, um, have a different pulse. And so owners in different markets are responding in different ways. But why are the owners really not concerned about the social, cultural implications that sport can have on their communities? And again, Couching this in the fact that we're dealing with uh, more than 100 individuals, some view their role as dealing with the social issues at the highest level. I'm going to give you an example. So Fred Wilpon was, was, was extraordinarily moved by uh, Jackie Robinson and what the Brooklyn Dodgers um, achieved. And when he built uh, the new city field, the grand entrance is the rotunda which emphasizes the role of sport in social change. Mm -hmm. And so the entire rotunda is called the Jackie Robinson Rotunda. But what's more important than the name is that when you walk in, it's essentially the history of how baseball changed society. Mm -hmm. and, and one could say, well, there was integration going on elsewhere. Jackie Robinson and what was accomplished changed sport, period. We put a period after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So for Fred, that's always been a major issue. He grew up with it. Uh, he knew a lot of, he, 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 an injury curtailed his career, mm -hmm. but he felt those issues very strongly. Other owners are strictly looking at it dollars and cents. Yeah, yeah. I, I make money by having eyeballs on the team, whether they're in the venue or they're watching on TV. And while we're in that space, eyeballs, to sport, I want to pay my players a very handsome wage. And so we're no longer in an era where uh, players are being um, victimized, where the owners were essentially making all the profits. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's some complaints, that maybe that the players are getting too much money. Right. What the owner, that owner is saying is, no, no, no. I will deal, deal with my foundation. I'll deal with corporate social responsibility but it doesn't take place on the field. Yeah, yeah. And I also know that there, there are risks. I mean, some of the owners I know are taking a risk by being, you know, overtly uh, supportive. Talk about some of the risks that you know of. Are they getting backlash from some of the corporate sponsors, those who are really moving the dial and moving the needle for social responsibility? I can give you one. I, I, I need to sort of keep. So there is one NFL team. Mm -hmm which basically keeps track, uh, that plays in a uh, relatively uh, conservative area, but has been very supportive of the players and keeps close count mm -hmm. on the number of complaints they get from their season ticket holders. Uh -huh. So it's an NFL team, and of course, most of, of their, their revenue base is season ticket sales. Mm -hmm. And one of the things when we discuss this issue, uh, because the team had taken a very strong position in support of the players kneeling for the national anthem and said that that was not something they were going to uh, object to. Uh, they, they had discussed it with the players, shared their perspective, but if the players came to the conclusion mm -hmm. that they were going to kneel, uh, the team was not going to take any negative actions. Mm -hmm. And they were telling me that in their market, it was running 50-50. Wow. Half, the, half the complaints they were... Now, again, some people might not have responded right. at all. But they were tabulating. So it's the only one I know of. But that was a team where, where the leadership group simply said, no, we're going to allow it. We're even, if the, we, they explained their position to the players, mm -hmm. had an open discussion with the players, left it to the players to decide. Right, right. 
So we're getting different issues. What we, what's been fascinating to me has been it really took a grip in uh, football, but it really hasn't emerged as a on the field issue for baseball players. Mm -hmm. I'm not, and, and, and there's not enough research to sort of figure okay why did that not, not, not happen? But what, and one other issue that I want to get into our conversation is when we speak when we change to collegiate sport. We, where the players are in a different relationship mm -hmm. with, with, with the universities, and there isn't a commercial benefit uh, in the short run for the players. Then we get into another set of issues, our college students who happen to play athletics, limited when the other college students are not. Right. And here you've seen, uh, for example, at, at Michigan, where Jim Harbaugh was very supportive almost dismissive of questions about why did he tolerate it? Mm -hmm. His response was, well, the college students. <laughs> college students do this all the time. Mm -hmm. So he took one position, but I didn't see that position uh, as robustly taken by a lot of the coaches in the Southeast Conference. Right. Again, you talk about the markets that influence what they say, how they right. say it. And, right. and Jim has a, a, a very high profile, mm -hmm. both in the uh, college rank, uh, ranks, as well as the fact that he simply has a very high profile mm -hmm. and a very large Twitter following and the social media thing. And yet, uh, again, I deal with the fact lots of individuals. Jim uh, really was almost dismissive of any criticism of his players who were uh, deciding to protest, mm -hmm. and, and he was supportive. Right. You have really simplified it to the extent possible and outlined this very convoluted process. I mean, to the, the influence of the markets, to the dynamics of trying to balance the risk, trying to protect the commercialization of the athletes, of, of the, the owner's best interests, um, being socially responsible owners, but not at the extent of the bottom line profit. And then this unique notion of, you know, student athletes versus students. It's a very complicated process, but I really appreciate um, the way you've tried to help us untangle some of the entanglements. And so as we conclude, I want you to share any any closing remarks or call to action about this notion of the intersection of sport culture and entertainment and how it affects free speech or activism in general? I, the most important issue, I think, for people to realize is that there's always been an argument in, in, in American society about how do we provide a base for uh, the expression of uh, opposition to the government, mm -hmm. all right? Now, when the founding fathers were crystal clear that that was to be protected in free speech, and it was the protection of, of the free press. In their time period, the most important platform was newspapers and um, pamphlets. And so they protected that. Obviously, they didn't foresee the rise of shopping malls. Mm -hmm. They didn't foresee social media and computers. And now, if we go back to what the framers were arguing, what they were arguing not so much was to protect the press, they were saying protect the platform. The key platform of the time was newspapers. And everybody can remember back from their elementary school history, Thomas Paine, and everybody was putting out pamphlets. That was the 19th, 18th century medium. Well, the medium today is dramatically different. In the 60s and 70s, it was shopping malls. And we had a lot of debate. Was it appropriate for people to protest at shopping malls, and the courts protected that right. Well, now we have a different medium. The biggest medium is sport. And it was raised for the first time in the Olympics in 68 in Mexico City, but now it is much larger. If you ask people to identify those who have the biggest so, sort of social status on that list are going to be athletes now. And so now that the platform is sport, the issue for our society is, well, now how do we protect protest at sport, which is, in effect, what the framers would have to be dealing with today if they were focused again on platform. Right. Sport is the country's leading platform. This is what attracts more people. You can just pull up the Nielsen ratings of the most events, shows watched every year, 
and eight of the top 10 are sports. All right. You can look at ticket sales, Major League Baseball averaging over 30 million ticket sales. You can start looking at uh, the media right deals that the NFL has agreed to with, with the network partners. You begin realizing, OK, this is more money exchanged for the production of this form of entertainment than for anything else. OK, it is the platform. And if it is the platform, then constitutionally, we actually have to address that issue is how do we protect access to that platform? And what the players are saying is that platform is where we want to express ourselves. Right. Wonderful. Well, speaking of platform, you are a wealth of knowledge. Um, again, Dr. Mark Rosentraub, the Bickner Endowed Professor of Sport Management here at the University of Michigan. I am so glad that we could use this platform to allow you to share with our audience this important and insightful information about free speech in sport. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosenthal. My pleasure, and thanks for having me. Thank you.